Welcome, my name is David Yoakum. I'm the director of the lab at DC, and it's my pleasure that we have today Amanda Ripley with us, a writer, best-selling author, a senior fellow at the Emerson Collective, and one of the things that we're gonna be talking about today is one of your best-selling books, The Smartest Kids in the World, which I highly recommend. You've also are regularly contributing to Time, to The Atlantic, to that pieces in the Wall Street Journal, Slate, Politico, you've been on TV, NBC, ABC, CNN, NPR, and whatever other three-letter <laughs> news outlets there are that are out there. Um, but a lot of very rich experiences, and it's a delight to have you with us today. I'd like to start off by talking about the book. And it's a very interesting concept where you follow three different students who are going from America to different to different countries, to Finland, to South Korea, to Poland, and you sort of immerse yourself in this cross-cultural comparison of schools. How, how did you sort of stumble upon the concept of this book, and why did you settle on that particular methodology? Well, I wish I could say it was like a linear process, and I just knew that this would be the way to do it. Of course, it's never like that, and what I knew was I kept hearing these stories about how great school was in other countries and how amazing kids were doing regardless of their income level and it didn't feel real like it didn't feel like um, granular I couldn't see it I couldn't imagine it everything I read all the data and there was a ton of data and all the stories uh, just felt at a distance and I knew from my own reporting in the States that the best way to get a story to make it interesting, to make it right, was to talk to kids, in addition to everyone else. But because no one almost ever talks to kids, it's like a really easy way to um, to beat your competition, frankly, and also to get a better story that's that's more grounded in reality. Um, so I, I wanted to go to these countries and see what was going on, but I knew I would need kids to help me on the ground. and. You know, luckily, there are like tens of thousands of teenagers who every year essentially switch places, who come to the United States to go to high school and live with a host family and vice versa. And those students are basically like amateur anthropologists. You know, nobody asks for their opinion, but in fact, they spend all day, every day, thinking about the differences between their neighborhood and schools and homes uh, back in the States and their neighborhoods and schools and homes in Finland or South Korea or wherever. And they're not, you know, obviously they don't have the whole picture. You have the data for that, you have other research for that. But they understand things, they, in, they can see around corners that the data can't get to. Yeah. And how did you select the, the countries and the students, or maybe you selected the students and then followed them the countries? How did you identify yeah. where to go? Yeah, well, I mean, basically I knew from the data, mostly looking at something called the PISA data, which is a test of 15-year-olds in 69 countries every three years that looks at math, reading, and science, and critical thinking. And I knew from that that there was about like a dozen countries that not only have better outcomes than we do on average, but, but better outcomes for equity. So even if you come from a low-income background in these countries, you have a better chance of achieving a pretty high level of education. So within that, I had to find the kids. And there are exchange programs that facilitate you know, kids going on these adventures. I wanted to find a sort of mix of kids, um, not all rich kids. Um, and so working with those programs, we were able to pretty quickly find students who were already going to these places and wanted to be part of this and were very open and, um, and interesting and each from very different parts of the country which is important because you know there was one boy from Minnesota who you know was going to basically the best we can offer as a country um, a public school in the suburbs that had all kinds of resources and and uh, and advantages and then he was going to South Korea and then we had a student from rural Oklahoma um, which basically from an education point of view her school was like in a different country than the boy in Minnesota so um, far fewer options, very different culture around um, around learning, and she was going to Finland. So they both were going to places with really exceptional results, um, but from very different places. Right. Well, it does provide this very rich window into looking at some of the aspects of schooling that often get talked about and kind of pushing a little bit of pressure on how much do those assumptions bear out? What do we actually see in terms of educational outcomes when those assumptions flip on and off? Yeah. And so why don't, why don't we talk about a few of them, and maybe to start with one that often gets a lot of airtime and a lot of proposals, the funding, mm -hmm. the money that we're spending on schools. Yeah. 
And I'll be curious to hear what you've seen in other countries. I know here in the States, there's a lot of different statistics that try to get a, kind of a cut at this, but yeah. one of them, kind of almost when you, when you look at it, it looks like spending at least the, is at the national, at the state level, is going up quite a lot in a kind of a bulk sense. And I was reading a statistics like this just the other week where they were talking about how the, the average per pupil, per student spending around the end of World War I was like $440 wow. in U.S. dollars. And then now flash forward to 2000 and it was almost 16 times as much, $8,000 per pupil. And I'm not actually sure what it is right now in 2017. Something like that, yeah. Um, but yeah, so what do, you, what do you know about how countries are spending um, money on students in relation to America and what it sort of, how is it working? Yeah, so we know from um, the OECD and other organizations that gather big data sets that we are spending more than all but a couple of countries per student on kindergarten through 12th grade education. So putting aside college altogether, which we spend, we also spend more on than any country. Um, how we spend it is tricky and it varies a lot. And the per pupil spending varies a lot. So in Oklahoma, they're spending in many places less than what, what kids need. But much of the country, um, we're spending more than the average for places with much higher, better results. So where that's going is always easier to speculate about than to actually prove. Um, certainly, just like in the rest of our lives, we spend far more on healthcare than other countries. And so you see that in the education spending because the biggest spend is on human capital, is on teachers, right? and staff and they have health insurance as they should and that is very expensive in the United States so that's that's a huge cost that doesn't directly affect learning right like it's important but it doesn't directly affect learning and if you have a really inefficient expensive healthcare system as we do it's going to drain all kinds of parts of the economy and and communities right including schools so that's part of it we also spend a lot on aids classroom aids we have more aids than the vast majority of countries in the world um, which is an interesting choice that uh, was made over time to to help teachers but also to make it seem like classes were smaller which parents like um, none of this there's no evidence that that investment has paid off in any way um, so that's a very again a very expensive you know even, even though we pay aids very little when you add it all up, it's a lot of money because there's a lot of aids. Um, we spend a lot on busing, on extracurriculars, on things that, that other countries, particularly smaller countries, don't have to deal with. So, so there's a lot of noise in there, but certainly from the kids' point of view, when, the, when I would talk to the kids and visit them in their countries, the American kids in Finland and South Korea and Poland, the way this manifested itself in their eyes was, you know, first of all, there was less technology in the classrooms in all these countries and the data bears that out so the u.s has over invested in classroom technology on average um and and again very little to show for that so smart boards computers yeah exactly iPads. like digital whiteboards ipads tablets computers um those are the kinds of things that we as americans um and, and by the way you know a lot of a lot of uh, physicians do this too. So this is again a similarity. Um, we consume, like that's something we're good at. And <laughs> so we sometimes I think overestimate the impact that a shiny toy will have. And we're not the only country to do this, but particularly because of the power of big tech companies in this country. I mean, they have very persuasive and they're in the schools. Um, and I don't think it's nefarious, but I don't think you can um, overestimate the influence of having Apple and Microsoft in 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 schools. I'm literally, you know, sending people to go meet with with school systems, and that's different than in other countries where they might be kept a little bit at a distance. So it doesn't say that technology won't help us learn, but it hasn't so far. So that's that's something that the kids notice. They don't see a lot of technology. Um, the schools sometimes are not as um, tricked out, but it, again, that varies, like the school in Oklahoma was not tricked out, the school in Minnesota was. In Poland, Tom's school, he'd gone from rural Pennsylvania to Poland, you know, it, it was very bare bones, and it didn't have a cafeteria, so the kids would bring their lunch or buy something from a little mm. counter. So there was just less kind of stuff outside of just paying the teacher. Right. Well, it's a very interesting parallel here with what we know about personal finances and happiness. And of oh, course, yeah. everybody talks about how money can't buy happiness, very common expression. And if you look at some of the data, after you meet, after you have enough salary to meet basic needs of, of shelter, of food, the 
polls on how happy people are, they start to they start to kind of flatline out as right. salaries go up and up and up. Right, it doesn't add anything. It, it doesn't add much, but the research in this area suggests that it has a lot to do with how people are spending the money. Hmm. And if you look at, for example, people who are spending the money to buy more things, yeah, it doesn't do a whole lot for their happiness. But if they're huh. using the funds to support experiences, trips, you know, dinners with family, those kinds of things actually do continue this kind of upward trajectory of how it can enrich your life. And so there's this important point that it's not quite right to just talk about more or less money. Yeah. You really need to be having the discussion on the level of what are we spending the money on. Right. And you were just giving some examples of in the school system places where it sounds like we're maybe not spending the money in the right way or maybe we're overspending on technology and on AIDS and other things. Are there places where we're underspending on things that would actually work? How could we spend the money better? Yeah, no, for sure in some places, again, varies a lot within the country. In some places we should be paying teachers more, like just without a doubt, just without a doubt. So on average, our salary for teachers is not below the norms for the rest of the world, but the rest of the world isn't so great on this either, honestly. So again, you have to be careful with this because some of the highest paid teachers in the world, depending on how you measure it, are in Spain, which has very mediocre outcomes, worse than the US on many measures. So just paying teachers more isn't going to be enough. But I would also direct that money towards um, helping teachers get better at their craft. And in many cases, that means giving them more time during the day to collaborate, watch each other, help each other meet, talk about strategies, brainstorm, create a culture of, you know, learning and helping each other and striving and experimenting. And those kinds of things really need to start before you get to the classroom. I think to start in, in education schools, in, in colleges that train teachers and teacher preparation programs. So that's where I would put my focus, not just money, but but you know, higher standards and rigor and and expectations and and then let that drive the kind of peer support and coaching mentality that not just great teachers, but people in any field that is challenging and dynamic need. You know, they need that kind of interaction and support and push back, but also help. Right. Well, this starts to bleed over into the second kind of common topic that I wanted to raise, which is teacher quality. We talk a lot about teacher quality. And I guess the first question is, what do we even mean right. when we talk about teacher quality? And then what do we know about kind of the, the state of the world in quality and are the things that can enhance it? Right. Well, so you appreciate this because, you know, there were a couple of studies that came out about 10, five to 10 years ago that really blew people's minds. They were done by economists in most cases, and they showed that, you know, certain teachers are really moving the needle dramatically. And if you had consecutive years, like three to five consecutive years of those teachers, it, it would change your whole life. You know, it could make the difference between, it could close the gap between how poor kids do and rich kids do in American schools, how black kids do and white kids do. It, it could really have this kind of, you know, silver bullet effect that we all want and dream of. And so it, it created a lot of energy around teacher quality. But then your second question was, you know, how do we get there? So what it looks like is teachers who manage to get all kids in their class to improve um, significantly over the course of a year, which is really challenging, right? And it, it's a much more complex dynamic than that suggests, right? Like it has to do with relationships, with trust, with the culture in the classroom, with the culture of the school, the support of the principal, um, lots and lots of things, that the discipline of the school, the involvement of the parents. So, so there's all these things kind of interacting and nobody really has cracked the code on how do you get to a kind of replicable method for creating high levels of teacher quality. All we know from around the world is that countries that tend to make it harder to become a teacher and more meaningful to study teaching tend to have more reverence for teaching and teaching seems to be more prestigious. So there's a lot of gray in there, right? But there's a lot that's not the same around the world. So the fact that that is kind of a pattern you see in most of these countries, even Canada, Canada is a great example, often overlooked in so many ways, but Canada is an example of a country that's a lot like us. You know, there's, there's no strong central government in Canada. There's actually no national department of education. There's a lot of distrust for the strong central government. 
they now have a higher immigrant um, ratio than the U.S. Um, Toronto has you know 200 languages or something in its school district, so this is a very diverse place now, despite what many Americans think. And you know they've got a, an, a similar child poverty rate, not quite as high as ours, but approaching ours, and they are killing it. Like, they are just like in the last 10 years have really shown that that you know it is possible to educate virtually all kids to high levels. But it, in Canada. It's not super uncommon to find someone who got rejected from education college and maybe came to the U.S. so they could still become a teacher. So they, they got rejected in Canada and they come to America because we have thousands of teacher preparation programs, many of which will accept almost anyone, um, regardless of their own background in education. And maybe they're not cut out for this, you know, maybe they are, but, you know, just having such a low bar, I think, is a tell. Like right. It reveals what we actually think about this profession, despite what we say. You know, that we actually, we say it's important, we say it's hard, we say it's intellectual, but we don't actually act, we don't act like it. Right. And this would be maybe a good contrast is, I think it's Finland that you talk about in the book, where, I mean, you should tell the details better than me, but generally they shut down a lot of schools and made it. Can you say a little bit about how selective they actually made the teaching profession? Yeah, so usually what you see is that countries get serious about this when they're up against a, a, a wall. And some are up against a wall and they don't get serious, but in the case of Finland, you know, Finland was very late to industrialize and it was a very rural place with a lot of illiteracy and, and huge disparities between urban and rural kids. And they were, you know, they were afraid of tipping into Russia. They very much wanted to be more part of Western Europe, in the, economically speaking. And so in the late 1960s, as part of a broader reform of higher education, they shut down their schools of education, which were a lot like ours, you know, a huge range of selectivity and rigor. And they reopened them in the most eight most prestigious universities in the country. And it was sort of luck, but the way that it happened led to a rise in seriousness for the profession and just as importantly a, a rise in in trust for the profession right and that's where like beautiful things can happen is when everybody knows in Finland how hard it is to become a teacher you know I, I met many teachers there who were rejected from education college the first time around applied the next year applied a third time you know and do I think that they should have gotten in the first if they'd gotten in the first time they still would have been a good teacher probably so but it sends a message right about how important and serious and difficult this profession is. Right. A prestige yeah. type of factor. Right. Which is a form of compensation, right? You're right. And how, I mean, you also earlier mentioned a space here that seems like it's worth unpacking a little bit around giving these professionals more time, frankly, yeah. and resources to be able to interact with each other, to develop their curriculums. Is this something that you've seen in other countries that are doing teaching well? Is this a common, like, is this a thread that we yeah. can maybe pick out of this? And this is something that comes through in the data as well, like when you look at how teachers, how much time they have, how they spend their time. It, it's often people think, oh, our kids don't go to school, you know, very long compared to other countries. Well, we're just about average for that, like, but what, what you do see is that teachers work many more hours teaching. They don't work more hours total, but much more of their schedule is filled with mm -hmm. classroom instruction. And again, that's partly because one of the only reforms we've invested in at scale was smaller class sizes. Now, this was more in like, you know, 90s and 80s, but doing that is incredibly expensive and it means that teachers have to teach more sections, right? So say right. if they're a high school, junior, junior high or middle school teacher, they have to teach, you know, six science classes instead of five. Um, and the evidence doesn't support, particularly in these older grades, doesn't support that decision, but it feels right, like it feels intuitively right that a smaller class size would be better, right? Mm -hmm. Your kid gets more attention. This is very hard to debunk, very hard to, to counter. But, you know, we know that this is the kind of thing that, that over time can be very expensive and really hard to undo. Like, politically. Um, so in other countries, what does this look like? You know, when I visited Kim's school in Pietasari, Finland, um, you know, there was a teacher's lounge and there was teachers like lounging in the lounge. <laughs> I don't know how many like teacher's lounges you've been to, but usually they're kind of like empty or else there's something, you know, there's like a sort of yeah. some free food is put out and everybody like descends on it in the U.S. Um, but the teachers are not there's no time for that. The teachers here routinely, they have a coffee break. There's like 15 minutes between classes. And this is true in a lot of countries. Let's 
put Asia aside for the moment, which is more of a pressure cooker model. But you know, there's there's no like insane bells that like scream in your ears every 53 minutes. It's like chimes. <laughs> so these are little things that speak to the quality of your life, not just for the teachers, but for the kids, right? But you know, they're in there, they're having espresso, they're complaining about you know maybe the assistant principal, just like teachers in America. But um, one thing they're also doing is is sharing ideas. Like, what are you doing about so and so? I'm really struggling. He's just not getting it. And I, well, here's what I did. And and then they come watch each other teach. And there's just more room for that. And I, just giving more teachers more time isn't enough, right? Like you have to have a culture of that that's supported, you know, from above. Right. But um, but it, it is visible in the way the teachers operate in these right. countries. Like you can tell there's more time for this kind of. And they work really hard. Like I don't want to suggest they're just chilling, but. Um, but it's, it feels more like, I mean, my job or your job, where there's like, you know, you have time to like go to the bathroom and stuff. Right. It's just more, it's more civilized. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is remarkable. So my wife, right. Sarah, teaches first grade. Yeah. And I remember when, years ago, when I was also teaching in college. Yeah. Having, you know, three hours of touch point class time uh -huh. on my schedule, uh -huh. but then also having, you know, 12 hours around that to be able to prep for right. the curriculum. And Sarah would be just in the classroom always and having to find an event time at in the night and other kind of moments she could steal to, to work in. to work on the curriculum. And, and you might think, well, if they're just teaching reading or arithmetic, they know that, so why don't they just go in and say it? Yeah. But of course, if you stop and think about it at all, that's terribly insufficient. You need to actually be thinking about what do we know about the science of how children learn yeah. and staying up with that literature yeah. and how can we craft the exact best sort of instruction today and tomorrow to be able to facilitate them. There's this whole, right. you're not just going in there and saying what you know about how to <laughs> right, read. Right. There's a full professional uh, science behind this. Which is actually the coolest part. Like, I don't know, when you see her talk about this with her colleagues or with you, like, this is something most Americans never get to see, but it's actually intellectually and and just emotionally really cool and interesting. And you know, to see them talk about, to see really good teachers talk about what are the, the common mistakes right. that we know kids make every single time we teach physics, every single time we teach fractions, right? We know actually, and there's and, but it takes time to read the science about this, but we know what those mistakes are. How do we let them make them, right? Not not preempt that. Let them make them, let them come to the realization without losing the kids who haven't made them uh, you know when, when a kid asks a question you want to shut it down but you don't want to miss this kid who hasn't spoken right I mean there's a there's a huge if you could see what's happening in the teacher's brain in, in a, a fraction lesson which seems straightforward um, there's a lot going on there and that's really the, the cool the magic of teaching and if there's no time for that you know not only do you make not only do does it make the profession worse, but kids really suffer. Right. Let let me ask a question that it ties together the the quality and the the funding question maybe, and it has to do with the the, the interactions that teachers might have with their students sort of outside of the classroom. And the way I come into this is, you know, right now in the district, housing prices are going up, and it can be depending on where you are in the city, it might be difficult for a teacher to live in yeah. the in the community. And Sarah and I happen to live very near the school that she teaches at, and we run into kids on in the street at bookstores, and it kind of there's this social nice. element to it that my intuition, but I don't know, and this is what I ask about, is having the teachers be a part of the community they're teaching in. Is that another ingredient that has any special role to play? And do we see this in other countries, for example? That's a really good question. I don't know is the answer, but I think it's a really good question. And it's going to vary depending on this very problem. Like I think in a lot of countries and urban centers, teachers have trouble paying the rent. But my suspicion, and it sounds like yours too, would be yes, because we know that this would help, right? We know that communities build trust, right, generally speaking. And, and if you're not in the community, then it's hard to have um, kind of empathy for what is happening in the community. Um, so I do think that's important. I don't have the data on it, but I think, you know, anything we can do to build trust and um, relationships between teachers, parents, and kids is like really powerful, more powerful than, you know, mm. most, of the, most of the things that we can buy. Right. 
Well, parents, you mentioned this. This is actually the third common one I wanted to, to, to touch on, which is parental involvement. If only we could get the parents more engaged. What do we know about parental involvement now versus throughout time, I guess, and then comparing other countries and data? What impact does it have on educational outcomes? Yeah, like this is definitely one of those phrases where we just like spending, where we're like, what does that actually mean? Like, what kind of parental involvement do we want? And what kind leads to learning? And I would argue that the, the kind we ask for has nothing to do with the kind that leads to learning <laughs> in most cases in the United States. So, um, just a quick story. So, there was a, a woman in Finland who I got to know who had two young children about the same age as my son at the time. So, my son was attending public school here in DC and she was in Finland. And I asked her, I said, so what does what your school ask you to do, like, as a parent? Like, how are you involved? And she sort of didn't understand the question. Like, I had to kind of keep rephrasing it, even though her English was excellent, better than mine. Um, but uh, she's like, well, I, I'm, I have to get the kids there on time, which is very challenging. <laughs> she, and that was about it. Like, she couldn't think of anything else. Um, Whereas my kid's school, you know, was asking us not only for money, uh, but also for someone to come to the cafeteria every day to hand out utensils uh, because they were low on staff to watch the kids or something. Uh, they're asking, you know, for bake sales, for, you know, come to events, come to this, come to that, um, bring in, oh, those, what are those, those box tops? Do you know what I'm talking about? Those, like... <laughs> You can like cut them out of like oh, cereal the little, boxes. Oh, yeah, the little square things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I and find I'm those sure. In our look, house all the look time. this is like, <laughs> I, I, mean, I don't want to get in trouble for this. Like, I'm thankful to General Mills or whatever it is that <laughs> donates this money. But like, you know, I used to spend all this time, and my kid too. He'd be like a box top, like laser alert <laughs> robot, like finding them all over our house, <laughs> right. and I'd be like, oh my god, we missed one, and and we'd have this like place for the box tops. And so, okay. <laughs> That's an American phenomenon, and it does not lead to learning. So while it is nice for schools to have extra money, make sure it's leading to learning. Because nine times out of 10, it's not leading to learning. What it does do is slowly sap your energy and time. As a parent. <laughs> As a parent. So you feel like you're contributing and you're involved in your kid's education because look at all these box tops, damn it. Like yeah. I am freaking here. And so, but that isn't actually lead to, okay, so what does lead to learning? Um, so all around the world, you know, there was a great study that, that was done also by the OECD where they looked at parental involvement and they linked it to PISA scores, which is this test of critical thinking in math, reading, and science. And what they found was in basically every time zone, um, the more parents read to their kids when they're little and the more they talk to them as they get older about news and movies and events and books, whatever, like the more, that's the, that's the thing. Like the conversation, the back and forth, the questioning, the thinking, right, out loud, that's the thing that leads to learning. And so when reading to kids, asking them questions about what you're reading, that, that's like one, like one of the few silver bullets we have, right? Um, it's like, you know, if it were a drug, it would be like penicillin. Right. Um, so why, why is it that the parental engagement we ask for more? Because in a lot of ways, it seems like it's, it's almost easier to tell parents, like, read your kids. Yeah. And, you know, here's some book suggestions if need. Right. Relative to, you know, coordinating all the logistics of right. a fundraising drive and taking those little stamps, and I don't actually know where they go after, <laughs> but it actually seems more complicated for the school staff to <laughs> right. do the fundraising than to do the coaching. It does create a lot of distraction for the principals and teachers. So, um, why do, yeah, why do we keep coming So, back to I it? think it's just, you know, our instinct, understandably, is that more money will lead to better things, right? And so we think this is a quantifiable way, right? A satisfying way to contribute to your community and your school to raise money, to sell cookies, whatever it is. Um, and it feels right. So, and, and there is good that comes out of that. Like, I don't want to totally diminish that. Like, there is, you know, a bake sale is probably the worst way to raise money ever in history, by the way. But. <laughs> But, uh, you know, there's communal mm -hmm. value there. Like, if, if there's communal value there, let's me, <laughs> let me right, take that back. Right. If there's like, people interacting, teachers, parents, kids, it's certainly fun for kids to eat sugar. That's universally true in every time zone. Um, but if there's, like, some community building happening around that, then I wouldn't say it's, it's for nothing, right? But it doesn't lead to your kids being more prepared for 
the very challenging world they're going to enter. Like it just doesn't. So let's not pretend that it does, right? So the same study that I mentioned from the OECD found that, again, across all these very different countries, I think it was 13 different countries um, that did this particular parental study, they found that the more time parents spent volunteering in activities at school, um, helping out in extracurriculars, attending games, the worse the kids did on a test of critical thinking and reading by age 15, even after controlling for income and other things. So, <laughs> You know, for me, that was kind of like, you know, I read that and I was like, okay, no more box tops. Like, I'm done. Right. <laughs> so I will always come for my kids' school. I will always be there if they ask me to do something that leads to learning. Right. And that's the litmus test I use. And sometimes they do, and I'm always there, and I try to prioritize it, and I try to talk to my kid, and I try to read to him. And I don't always succeed, but it's, you know, it's, it's really helpful to have, like, priorities in your head. And then if there's time to... Um, bake Rice Krispie treats, awesome. You know? right. I wonder if some of this connects back in a way to the, the question of how the money is being spent, mm -hmm. where I've seen before you know, classroom teachers who they need some discretionary funds yeah. basically to be able to tailor yeah. the classroom with the particular books they want, the particular tools that they want. Yeah. And so it's not just the standard issue textbook, and so it's not coming directly. So you know, right. we find ourselves in this weird situation of there's a lot of money at the school, but then we're going out and spending our own money on books for the kids. And it's always struck me as a bizarre scenario. Yeah. But I wonder if, if that's what causes you know the fundraising, the cake drives, because then you can at least, as the Gives teacher, you some, use your yeah. professional judgment. And, and look, right. most, I'd say, I don't know, I mean, it'd be interesting to ask your wife and other teachers, but like at least half the time, the, that's all this kind of stuff is driven by parents. Like it's not teachers who are driving it or, or the principal. Um, so it's really a parent driven and the more parents do it, the more they feel guilty if they don't do it and it's like this, you know, right. feedback loop. To your point, I think it's a really good point that reflects again this broader way we look at teaching. So when I started working at Time Magazine and I was like 28, I was given a credit card that had the Time Warner on it and I could go buy stuff that I needed and expense it to the company. Um, I was given business cards, right? right? I was like a punk. I didn't know what I was doing, right? But like, I was treated like a professional. Most teachers do not have business cards. They cannot go expense basic things like that. This is a reflection of how we look at the profession, right? And it's very slow to adapt. We've, we are now asking these people to do things that we never asked them to do before. We're asking them to differentiate at very high levels for huge range of abilities to teach not just how to read, but how to, how to argue a point, how to compare and contrast, how to see patterns that are complex. And we need them to do these things, right? Like we need that for the modern world. Freaking give them an expense account. Do you know what I mean? Right, like right. this is this is crazy, right? Have we seen have, have you seen other countries that yes, do this? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and it goes to the same point about seeing the Finnish teachers, you know, sipping coffee in the lounge d discussing problems. Like this is um, a different way of looking at the profession, right. and you know, it takes. It's sort of like this. Part of it is how we think about learning and intellectualism in the United States. Like we are not, we don't have a lot of reverence for math and engineering and, and these things the way that other countries do. Um, but we can cultivate that. I think it's not impossible for us to work around that. Um, but it's sometimes that we don't even ask the question. Like, you know, teachers, like, they have a lot of things on their mind. They're not going to like demand business cards. You know what I mean? Like, right. so so some of it's a failure of imagination on the parts of you know, principals and school leaders and, um, but and it is, it is all of those little things together, the business cards, yeah. the spin scout that feed into this larger concept of the, the prestige and the sense totally. of professionalism. And, and I think I should add that it's not just how we look at teachers, it's how we look at kids. So Elizabeth Green wrote this great book on how to build stronger, better teachers as a profession. And she went to Japan among other places. And she noticed that when recess happened, all these elementary school age kids would run out into this huge courtyard where um, they were unsupervised and they would play with unicycles, like I kid you not, which on like cement. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right. and, and there was no, and the teachers were not standing there yelling at them and like breaking up fights or comforting crying children. Like they were not. They were inside drinking their tea and yeah. discussing, you know, real difficult intellectual problems, cognitive challenges. So 
so part of it is when you when you kind of think that your you know kids need to be watched all the time they need to have exactly you know 48 seconds between classes or they'll get into trouble um, and they go through x-rays you know metal detectors to get into class and you, and you do have significant levels of violence in some schools I would argue not as many as we act like we have um, but when you when you don't trust kids and you don't think teaching is a serious intellectual you know knowledge worker job this is what you get it's fascinating so i want to shift and ask a, a slightly different question which is about what do what do kids want out of school what is the the substance or the aim out of school and there's a couple of different uh things i've read recently that are kind of interesting windows maybe into this one of them was there's a book by paul goodman actually in the 50s called growing up absurd where mm -hmm. it's about childhood delinquency, but one of the thematic points that he makes throughout it is that to the extent school is geared towards landing a job, mm. what do we know about the the appeal of that job to a kid? And this was when there was a lot of, you know, in the 50s, lots of angst about the rat race, yeah. and one of the points he was making is that it's not that the schools, like the methods and things aren't uh, necessarily sort of set up correctly is that when kids look at it they and they see the ultimate outcome it's like I don't want to be a part of that anyway <laughs> so why do I want to spend 12 years yeah. grinding down for this outcome that that doesn't give a lot of meaning yeah another direction I've seen this is that uh, and Ben Sassy makes this point and this is a recent book the, the vanishing American adult and it's it's kind of a it's a secular version of a lament about some of the religious aspects coming out of school around how it's it's taken some of the discussion out about really the the meaning and purpose oh, of life yeah. and the, the color isn't necessarily to put religion back into it right. but you know whenever you're you're an adolescent and you're growing up and you're trying to find it's your place question. in the world, this is a yeah. big question if all the intellectual discussion you're getting is sort of math drills and reading drills right. where's the forum for for where to talk and let me give you one third one this was just in the new york times a couple of weeks back by uh, daniel hadler let me stick it uh -huh, uh -huh. And the, the title of this piece was, You Want Teenage Boys to Read? Easy. Give them books about sex. And, <laughs> and, again, and again, the point here was sort of, you yeah. know, this is one example of what is it that, in this case, adolescents are thinking about all yeah. the time, and what are we doing in the classroom to, to talk about it? And I think throughout all of these themes, what I'm getting at here is this question of what is it that kids are really sort of eager to want to be knowing about? And how well are we doing in the school system for thinking about those, really those ultimate aims that might be what latches them on to be incentivized and engaged in school? Yeah, that's, those are really great questions. I mean, just like I find reporters very rarely talk to kids in any meaningful way, um, you know, people who make education policy don't talk to kids. Like, that's just not something that's done. Um, once in a while you'll see a student on a panel at an education event and it's always like so refreshing but it's it's just very unusual we do know that around the world countries that systematically solicit student feedback tend to do better um, on the PISA test and other measures of success you and you mean through the school like actually surveys yeah, exactly. and, and interviews now, now most school systems do surveys DC does surveys they're happy to show you all their surveys um, but they tend to be school-wide surveys about like do you feel safe and this is all important right like right. it's good to know for sure if you feel safe but they're they tend to sort of not lead to much um, what we find in the research is that classroom level surveys are way more useful to teachers and they reveal things that the teachers can't see because they're not 10 years old and they're not sitting in the and they know the material so it's kind of like the reason I have an editor, you know, I need someone who doesn't, who can give me feedback. Kids are that for the teacher. And there's been some great research on how student surveys, if you ask kids the right questions, they're better at predicting highly effective teachers than trained professionals who come in, master evaluators. And it's partly because the N is big, like there's a lot of kids. So even if one kid just kind of like, you know, doesn't take the survey seriously and one kid hates the teacher or whatever, the, the average comes out to be meaningful. And what you find is if you ask kids very specific questions like, um, does this teacher push me past my, where I want to give up? Um, do, do kids in this classroom behave the way the teacher wants them to most of the time? Like, you can't ask, you know, do you like this teacher? Right. <laughs> but, like, if you ask smart questions, then you find that kids are not only honest, 
but they give specific actionable feedback to teachers in ways that test scores never will. Like the worst feeling in the world, right, must be to get test scores back, as DC just did, and see that, you know, a bunch of your kids didn't move or went backwards and not know what to do, right? I mean, most teachers want their kids to learn, like they want the right thing. But not knowing what to do is just a terrible, terrible feeling. And so if you instead have survey data from that class that says, here's how your kids answer this question compared to 3,000 kids the same age around, around the city. Um, your kids seem to think that you're really good at like classroom management, like you're really good at managing behavior. Your kids behave well in this class, which is a prerequisite to learning. But they don't feel like you push them really hard, like it's not very challenging. That's really good to know, <laughs> right? So this is the kind of thing that, you know, kids can tell you a lot. And to your point about, you know, does, are we actually meeting them in things that they want to do? I, I mean, I think we very rarely ask them what they want to do. And we, you know, our knee-jerk reaction to that is, well, how do they know? They're a kid, you know, you ask a, you ask a kid what he wants to do, he's gonna tell you he wants to play video games, right? And eat cake, I mean, so, <laughs> But if you get past the initial video game and cake answer, you can find out really compelling things. I mean, I think the kids I've talked to, and there's a lot of kids I haven't talked to, have told me that what they want is they want school to teach them how to pursue their passions, and maybe more importantly, the skills to find passions, right? Right. And so that's a lot of things, and you do need to know multiplication. <laughs> like, right. there is no way around that. But um, I think you're right that, that if we ask kids more what they want out of school, school would be better and kids would be more bought in, which is the elixir that makes everything easier. Right. Well, so what can we do now, right away? So everybody is motivated by this conversation. And, and maybe I'll ask it for, for teachers first and then for parents. So what would you say to teachers that they could start doing this week, next week? Yeah. I, well, it's, school's just starting a lot of places, I don't know, you know, depending on when you're watching this, but um, it's a beautiful moment to ask kids what they want out of school, you know, and to set specific goals for them, right? And to not, not just make it like pro forma, but come back to it over and over again throughout the year. And, and I think for parents too, right? Like, what do you want to achieve this year? And what are the steps like to getting there, right? Because that's where kids need help is, is, is not just setting big goals, but like figuring out how to get there. That's the hardest part, right? Um, and I think, you know, for parents of, of children under 12, reading to your kids should, is just the easiest thing you can do. Like it's, and not just reading them, but like asking them questions about what you're reading. Like, why do you think he said that? What does this word mean? I, I was always surprised um, when my son was younger, how many words he, he was acting like he knew, but when you actually asked him, like, what does that mean? He doesn't know. <laughs> so he, they just, they kind of go with the flow, <laughs> unless you ask. Um, and it actually makes reading a little less boring as the adult. Um, <laughs> yeah. When right. you have like right. a little bit of conversation. Um, so those are things that I would do. And to your earlier point, I thought you made a really good point about um, you know, talking about morality and philosophy with kids in, at home, but also in the classroom. You know, I was really struck by this year my child just started, he just left after six years of public school and he's at a, he's at a Catholic school. And I have, you know, I have mixed feelings about that, there's good and bad, but what I noticed on day one is that they had this whole set of vocabulary they could draw on and like triggers and emotions and aspirations that about being a good person and I mean, you know, all schools say that, right? They're all like empathy, kindness, blah, 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 blah. But like, this seemed bigger, like it seemed like they could, even putting aside what denomination it is, like the fact that they could, they could play these notes, you know, it was like they were playing the whole piano. And they had that ability, whereas most, in, in the public school, they were kind of limited to like, you know, these eight keys. Um, so there must be ways, right, without being overtly religious, um, to widen that conversation and to talk about hard questions you know, about, about how to be a good person and, and forgiveness and um, humility, right? Like beyond just the, I, I mean, at some point, I think the word, words like bullying and empathy have lost their value for kids at this point because they're overused. Um, so, you know, getting more creative about that is a great idea. Right. Well, last question, what's on the horizon 
for you. What are you What are you working on next? What should we be looking forward to seeing coming down the pipeline? Yeah, well, I'm thinking a lot about you know um, ways in which um, we can learn still from kids around the world and in new ways of looking at that. Um, so I'm finishing a story now for the Atlantic about why it is that girls are doing so much better than boys in the Middle East. So in really some of the most traditional patriarchal societies in the world, girls are outperforming boys in almost every subject, at almost every age level, by sometimes one to two years ahead. Um, which on the one hand feels like, yay, you know, girl power, <laughs> but in fact is a, is a huge catastrophe. Um, and it's not just in the Middle East. So all over the world, girls are pulling ahead of boys by almost everything you can measure in academics including in the United States, where girls now go to school longer over their lifetime, they are more likely to take AP tests, they're more likely to go to college. And on the one hand, you're like, yay! <laughs> but look, we cannot leave half the country disengaged in education. Like, this is unacceptable and suggests there's something, there's something institutionalized at work here, where on average, not always, schools are designed for girls. Interesting. Well, I look forward, oh, I have so many questions, but I'll wait. <laughs> until it comes out and maybe cool. we can talk more then. But Amanda, thank you for this. This is really great. Yeah, Again, Amanda Ripley, if you if you haven't read it, The Smartest Kids in the World is, as we were saying, a really phenomenal window in this entire debate. I think you also have a documentary on this yeah, coming so, out. Am I allowed so to say that? So there's a documentary yeah. that a very talented filmmaker is working on and you know, we'll have more on that in 2018, but um, following new kids to new countries and it's, it's a really, it's a beautiful thing so far from what I've seen, yeah. I'm so, excited about it. That's great. So a lot more coming, and thanks to everybody for joining. If you haven't gone to the lab.dc.gov, please do. You can sign up for listservs where you can get more notices of these types of interviews for the lunch at DC and a lot more things that we're doing. Thank you. Amanda. Thanks. Good to see you.